Okay, what's going on everybody? My name is Mang. And I am here today to talk to you about The Matrix. And uh, as usual, I do not mean the <laughs> classic action sci-fi hit of 1999. Uh, I am talking about, as it refers to Shadowrun. Um, so this is going to be kind of probably a lengthy video um, filled with uh, it's half kind of role playing discussion and half kind of mechanical discussion as it relates to fifth edition Shadowrun. And that is really only the only perspective that I'm going to talk about it from because I don't know basically anything about earlier editions of how it works or anything like that. So this is only based on Shadowrun fifth edition. Um, so we're going to be talking about the Matrix itself, what it is, what it isn't, how it's used, how most people use it, um, and then we're going to talk about Deckers specifically and how they uh, use it more than most people, how they abuse it for their own benefits, and uh, mechanically how it kind of all works as far as 5th edition. Um, now I am not the expert on this by any means. Um, but I have an okay grasp of how it works, and um, you'll kind of see that you don't really need to be an expert on it. So, the first thing that I want to just do for this video is I want to just read the opening section from the core rulebook about the Matrix. <clears throat> we use it every day to read our email, pay our bills, talk to our friends and loved ones. It monitors our money, handles our utilities, and manages the traffic on our streets. Billions of people use it constantly, from the hungry family in Redmond to the CEO in Neo Tokyo, and everyone in between. It is the Matrix, the digital world within a world made of fiber optic cables, networks, and more data and computing power than has ever existed in the history of the planet. A record that exists today so it can be broken tomorrow. Everybody uses the Matrix. Most Shadowrunners have multiple pieces of gear that use it, often interacting with the Matrix without them knowing it. Smart Links use it to look up local conditions and calculate firing solutions. Medkits access medical databases to analyze and diagnose injuries and then recommend treatment. And your clothes and armor use it to detect wear and tear and tell you when it's time to do the laundry. Some Shadowrunners do more than just soak it information the gear gathers for them. They use the Matrix as a tool and a weapon. They glide through it, bending it to their will, making it dance and spin to the tune they call. Such a runner is called a hacker. There are two kinds of hackers, classified based on how they interact with the Matrix. Deckers, who use cyberdecks to access the bones and muscle of the Matrix and twist the structure to their will. And technomancers, who have a downright weird ability to interfere and control the digital world without the aid of technology. Hackers play critical roles on shadow running teams. They open locked doors, muffle alarms, cancel security calls, unearth buried facts, monitor things other team members can't see, and keep the heat off long enough for the rest of the team to finish the run. In a scrap, they can take control of or destroy opponents' weapons and gear. They also play an important role in defense. Every other skilled team in the world has a hacker running interference for them. If your team doesn't, you're vulnerable to whatever electronic havoc they decide to bring down on your head. Quick tip, leaving yourself vulnerable is a bad idea. Um, yeah, so uh, we're not going to be discussing Technomancers at all just because screw that. Um, so let's talk about the, what the Matrix really is then. Uh, that gave you a general idea. But the Matrix is pervasive, uh, to say the least. And I guess what the Matrix isn't is it's not a digital representation of the physical world, okay? Um, when you access the Matrix, depending on how you access it, um, you don't just see the physical world, um, at, at least as far as virtual reality goes. And I guess, I, I guess I, I mean, I'm kind of jumping around here. Uh, so I guess we'll break down the different ways that people access uh, the matrix. The most common way is through augmented reality. And this is a concept that is not foreign to us in 2015. Um, there are uh, there are like smartphone apps that you can download. I'm pretty sure right now 
that you can just bring up on your phone and you kind of just use the camera of your phone to look around a, a street and uh, it might give you information on various businesses that it recognizes uh, and things like that and give you info. And that technology exists exactly, pretty much exactly like that in Shadowrun's future. Um, except it doesn't really just, uh, it doesn't use like the camera. Well, I mean, I guess it does use the camera, uh, but it doesn't just like look at a building's like logo and recognize it. It's a bit more involved than that. But it works the same way. You can use your, your comlink, your phone in Shadowrun, and just look at the screen and kind of whip it around. Um, and see info about various businesses and people and things like that. You'd also be kind of like a yokel, I guess, if you did something like that. You'd look like a moron. Uh, because they've progressed beyond that. So, that's kind of uh, archaic and mundane. So, a step up from that is by using um, some sort of uh, ocular wear of some shape. Uh, so these could be glasses, sunglasses, contacts, goggles, uh, even a monocle if you want, uh, that are fitted with an image link. And so this piece of gear, say sunglasses, has an image link installed in them uh, that wirelessly interacts with your comm link. And so those same, uh, I mean, like it, it tracks what you're looking at. And it interacts with your comm link to say, what am I looking at? What is the info about this? What can you tell me? Blah, blah, blah. And then it projects, projects that info right onto your field of vision. Uh, this is similar, basically, to something like Google Glass or how Google Glass would have been. Uh, and I, I imagine this is not too far off, off for our, our present time. Uh, but that's still a bit mundane. We can, we can get better than that. So a step up from that would be having, say, cyber eyes. So you get implanted uh, prosthetic eyes that have computer chips in them that they themselves can then wirelessly interact with your comm link and do the same function. And they just project um, the, the, the uh, augmented reality right onto your nerve endings or whatever. And so you just, boom, it's there. You see it. Um, and you can also, I'm, not, I'm just talking about from a visual standpoint, but you can also do audio. Um, so you can, in the same way, you could just put your comm link up to your ear, or you could get earbuds, or you could get cyber ears that uh, do audio augmented reality objects or arrows. Uh, so these could th be, you know, things be like advertisements, or uh, if there's like a song playing in a in a, like a mall or something like that you could just um there'd probably be a little icon that you could swipe and you could suddenly you know hear the full song you know right in your ears or something like that um and then there's also i believe uh that you can get a cyber nose i think that's a thing i don't know if that's in the core rule book for fifth edition but uh same thing just with uh smells uh, there's also AR gloves, which are basically like haptic feedback gloves, which is, again, not something really crazy far-fetched for our present time, that basically lets you feel things as far as augmented reality. Um, so those are all kind of, if you, you want to get more cybernetic or something like that, you can do that. Uh, but finally, the final step, the next step up, is called a direct neural interface. And what this is is the, the, the easiest way to get it is something called trodes, which is basically like little uh, things that you'd put on a head, uh, like a headwear, like a, ha a hat or something like that. Um, and you'd attach this to your head. It's not, it's not an invasive thing or anything like that. It just kind of attaches to your, to your skull, which I mean, that sounds really invasive, but it's basically like a hat. Um, and a direct neural inter interface, or DNI, connects your brain to electronic devices. And so it's a direct basic connection from your comm link uh, or other device straight into your, 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 your cerebral functions. Um, so you don't, need, you don't need cybernetic eyes, you don't need glasses with image link or anything like that because your comm link is putting these, these augmented reality objects 
directly into your brain. It's simulating these objects uh, as if you were really seeing them or as if you were really hearing them or touching them or smelling them or tasting them. You know, it, it's, it's the most direct way to simulate all this stuff straight into your brain. It's not really expensive, and uh, it's it's a fairly common thing because why not? That's, you know, rather than just, uh, you know, wearing some glasses or something, you can always just, boom, have it. Um, also, you can get a direct neural interface if you implant a data jack uh, or your comlink or a cyber deck straight into your, your skull, um, which is something that not many people do. I mean, it's somewhat common among shadow runners, but for regular civilians, there's really no need to implant your phone into your head. <laughs> um, but if you did, if you do that, you also get the direct neural interface. You don't need any of the other nonsense. Um, okay. So that's augmented reality. Um, you know, this is basically just things that you, that much like our current world, our current understanding of augmented reality, it's just things that affect, that are overlaid atop the real world. And so, I mean, this is, this is obviously used in commercial civilian living is for advertisements and, um, a lot of nonsense like that, but it's also useful in the shadow running world, um, for instance, uh, as, say, the decker for the group, if I'm outside a building that they're breaking into and looking through, um, if they need to find, like, a specific room, I could pull up the blueprints outside, uh, look through the whole thing, and give them an augmented reality object of, like, a an arrow, like, literally an arrow pointing them straight to this room where they need to be. I mean, that's kind of a pretty simple example, but uh, it all depends basically on how creative you can be. And I find that the, the decker, the hacker, is generally one of the more creative positions on a team, so that's why I'm kind of drawn to it. So that's augmented reality. And this is how most people are going to interact with the Matrix on the day-to-day -day basis. Um, you can get, I mean, your, your, your music your text messages, your emails, Google searches, all that stuff is just, you know, boom, right in your field of vision. And so, um, you, I mean, you can, you, the, the Comlink, of course, has the touch screen, so you can, you can type in a search and whatever, just like we do now. Uh, but if you have a direct neural interface, all you have to do is just think it. Um, and so it's kind of like how we want technology to be right now, where you just have in your field of vision, you just get a text message and you just think the response and send it out and boom, you don't have to touch anything. You can just keep doing whatever you're doing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really cool. And that's how most civilians and stuff interact with, uh, with the matrix. Um, like <sighs> physical desktop computers and all that are basically completely archaic. Some people have it, but it's basically like a joke or you're, you're, you're an, like, you're a weirdo. All right. If you have, if you actually have a physical thing you sit at with a screen, you are devoted to an ancient time is basically what it is. You're, you're pretty much laughed at. Um, time has moved on from that. Um, because it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like HoloLens. Uh, the, the way HoloLens works currently, where you're wearing this kind of headset and you pretty much project a screen onto any surface in your field of vision. That's kind of how like stuff is in uh, in Shadowrun, but you don't wear a headset. You can just have it as part of like your cyber eyes or contacts or something like that. Like, it's way less. Um, it's, it's much smaller than that. Um, they do have projectors still, but they're like 3D projectors. They project like 3D kind of hologram type images. Um, so yeah, everything's kind of moved on. Okay, so moving on from augmented reality into the other way you can interact with the Matrix, which is virtual reality. So if you want virtual reality, you need a direct neural interface no matter what. 
Um, depending on how you get that, I mean, you can get that through the implant or through the trodes. Uh, trodes is obviously a lot cheaper, a lot uh, less invasive. You can just go home, sit in a chair, put on the trodes, and boom, you're flying. Um, and there are there are two ways of entering virtual reality. There is the very, very common one. And then there's the, I think it's pretty much a legal one. So the, the most common one is called cold sim virtual reality. Cold simulation virtual reality. Uh, so this is how most people are going to interact with virtual reality because you are you mesh with the matrix through SimSense filters. So you're the, the, the trodes, the interface, it's kind of blocking a lot of the harmful, dangerous signals from interacting with your brain. Um, so things are not as intense. Uh, things are not quite as quick and just, you know, lightning fast because everything is basically being processed before it hits your brain. It's still virtual reality, and like I said, a lot of people, this is how most people use it, because it's safer, uh, they don't need anything more than that, it, you feel like you're in virtual reality. Um, and so, you, as a hacker, you, you, you can definitely use that, and you probably will a lot of times, um, but you also have the option of going to the other mode, which is hot sim virtual reality. Uh, this is where it turns off all the filters, all the kind of protecting agents that are blocking filtering signals, and uh, you just get flooded. You just get everything, the whole 100% everything. Um, and so instead of just kind of... It says that uh, you're flooded with SimSense signals that can even affect your limbic system. So you can not only see here and touch the matrix, but you can feel it. So like it, it influences your entire brain, and apparently it's potential potentially extremely addictive because it's basically like you're you're part of a different reality at that point. Um, and so in hot sim VR mode, you get you actually get a bonus to all your hacking actions because you're so just in you're in everything. It I mean it's. As close to technomancers, I guess, as, as regular people can get. Um, but the difference... So you're wondering, is why wouldn't you always be in, in uh, hot sim? The difference is... Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's a concept called biofeedback. Which is basically where... Um, Damage in the ma like being damaged in the matrix, basically electrical overcharges and stuff like that that are sent through you, uh, really against your will <laughs> most of the time, unless you have a fetish, I guess. Uh, like electrical biofeedback goes through you and hits goes into your brain because, like I said, you have a direct neural interface either way, um, so stuff can hit your brain. In cold sim VR mode, you take this as stun damage. So you could potentially die from it, but you would have to take them. Like, your trodes would have to, like, melt around your skull. Like, it would have to be ridiculous. So it's it's a lot safer. Hot sim, you take it as pure physical damage because everything is just coming through straight into your brain. Um, so you can die from it. It's still, I think, it's unlikely. But, uh, yeah, it's a lot more dangerous. And that's why it's kind of, uh, it's illegal to kind of do that modification Okay, so virtual reality, what happens? So when you go into virtual reality, what, what do you see? I guess, let me, let me preface almost everything, really, about the whole Matrix concept, especially in relation to mechanically. Um, the, the rule book, uh, the core rule book, and data trails and stuff like that, it... It gives rules for basically everything, and it gives fluff for even more. Um, there is a tremendous amount of information about the Matrix and hacking it in the books, and it kind of scares people away, but it really shouldn't. Because a lot of the Matrix and a lot of hacking, what it really should be and what it should come down to is more or less role-playing. Um... 
if something makes sense, if something works for your game, doesn't break it, and adds to the whole kind of fun, entertaining factor, you should let it happen. Uh, which goes for a lot of concepts throughout all of RPGs, but the Matrix kind of especially. Um, and so I'm going to touch on some. Con- I'm going to touch on most of the concepts, but I can easily see a bunch of these just being ignored completely as far as a full Shadowrun campaign or something. But okay, when you go into virtual reality, um, you. Well, no matter what, really, you as long as you're using the matrix, you have to be on a grid. And your grid is basically like your your ISP, as far as we understand it nowadays. Um, it's how you connect to the matrix. And I get, I mean, it, uh, you're probably gonna at some point ask the question of then, you know, who, what who who owns the matrix. Uh, you know, where, who's, where are all the servers and things like that? Because when you go, when you log onto the internet, um, you have to access some sort of server, no matter what you're doing. Uh, the matrix is kind of like that, except it's been conglomerated a lot more. Uh, it's been centralized a bit. Um... But still, it, it's kind of segmented somewhat. And it's segmented by these grids, which is, you know, again, like how you, how you connect to the matrix. And so there are, there are a lot of different grids, like there are different ISPs. But more so than ISP, there are different, a lot different ranks of grids. Tiers of grids, I guess. There are local grids. Local grids are sponsored and kind of supported and all that by local governments. So, um, like, I live near Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which, coincidentally, is where our Shadowrun campaign is starting. Um, And so Milwaukee, Wisconsin would host, support their own local grid. Um, And you kind of have to... This is not... This is not a free grid. Um, Surprisingly, the local grid is not free, as far as I understand it. Uh, Again, I'm not complete on everything, but based on how this is written, uh, I don't believe the local grid to be free. And so the local grid is is a decent connection. It's not terrible, Um, but it gets worse the farther you are away, which normally is not a huge deal. But if you're trying to hack, if I'm trying to hack into a host that's on the Seattle grid, um, there's going to be complications. It's it's not like everything is not just, you know, together. Uh, Surprisingly, actually. I mean, I can search up information about anything, but to actually hack something physically or not even physically, I guess it would be kind of physically in a whole different state or whatever city. uh, It's more complicated. So there are local grids that are based on each kind of local area. Uh, the bigger the city, the better the local grid, the bigger the local grid, and a lot of small places won't even have one. Then there are the uh, the um, global grids. Global grids are, they can be accessed anywhere on the planet uh, as long as you have a basically a subscription. And so this is the most like something like a, an ISP. And each of the big 10 corporations, so this is Renraku, Neonet, Seder Krupp, uh, Ares, they all have their own global grid. And they all are, you have to pay for them, and it's kind of a bit of a status symbol. That if you're a member of one of the, if you can afford to have this kind of connection to this grid, which is generally more or less top of the line, uh, it, it's, it's a bragging kind of thing. Um, if you're a hacker, you can hack onto any grid you want. Uh, so if I was on, if I was just, if I didn't pay anything and I was good and I was a risk taker, I could hack onto the Renraku global grid for a good connection. Um, so those are the global grids you have to pay for them, but they're really good. Okay. 
Finally, what if I don't want to pay for anything, but I want the Matrix? Well, you're not out of luck, because uh, it says that the corpse would never have been able to get away with the completely throttling access to the Matrix. So, there's a public grid provided by underfunded nonprofits, outdated satellites, and the occasional good Samaritan who's willing to share a wireless access point or two. The public grid is slow, low resolution, and unreliable, but at least it's globally accessible. It's the barons of the matrix. And I think they're 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 kind of making a reference to something in Shadowrun as far as the barons goes, like the slums. Uh, but it reminds me of World of Warcraft, and I think it's probably apt. Like you just get all the you just get all the little shits on the public grid, and it's bad. It's it's slow and it's shit. Um, so yeah, so no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter what you're paying, no matter what's going on, you always have Matrix access. That's just the nature of the game. So no matter what, if you have devices that can go access the Matrix, they can access the Matrix. And that means they can be hacked. Um, so yeah, so there's the grids. And I, I'm skipping around here, but I, I might as well mention this because it's very it's along the same concept. Um, there are security measures on the grids. And I guess uh, I want to explain this correctly so you, you don't just get all confused. Um, but there are the grids, which is basically just the Internet. And then there are hosts, which is kind of like websites. And... We don't really kind of understand that because everything we do is related to generally a website. Um, but if you imagine just kind of a big lobby, uh, that would be kind of what a grid is. Not exactly, but close enough. Whereas specific websites are hosts. Um, and so this big lobby that anybody can kind of just go on if you're, on, if you're in the grid, uh, this is all protected security-wise by a a group called the Grid Overwatch Division of the Corporate Court. And this is shortened to God. <laughs> so the security force for the grids is known as God. Which is, I'm sure they, they love that acronym. And uh, so basically anything you do illegally, just in the in, on a grid, uh, you have the potential of bringing down the force of God. Uh, they're basically omnipotent. They will find you eventually. And they're, they don't actually have any physical, um, like physical presence. They're only, they're only a part of the matrix, but once they track you down digitally, uh, they'll, they'll track your physical person through, you know, GPS and all that kind of stuff, and they'll immediately notify your location and what you did to the local authorities, and they'll be they'll be at your door or whatever. So, yeah, you don't want to piss off God. <laughs> uh, but that's the grid. Well, I don't want to go into the host later, so I'll talk about that. But hosts have their own security. We'll get to that later. Okay, so what I was going to originally talk about. When you log onto a grid in virtual reality, you log into basically this lobby area. And at the most basic level, uh, which is what we'll just talk about for right now, at the most basic level, you basically kind of get space, I guess. Uh, you get basically a black plane with a black sky. <laughs> probably not. That would be really confusing to look at, so it's probably better than that, but something akin to that. It's very basic. And throughout all this blackness, you're going to get a lot of little points of light, um, which are not just, they're not stars, like they're not like little dots, they're icons. Like if you remember in Jurassic Park, when uh, the girl is like hacking Unix or whatever she is, and she's just kind of going through this sea of little icons and stuff like that, basically just picture that, but in full virtual reality, and you can kind of fly around. And... So all these little icons are devices. These are devices that have a physical analog. So every single person's comlink, and <laughs> everybody has a comlink. Like, unless you're a bum with living in a box, you you probably have a comlink. The cheapest comlink is 100 new yen, which is practically nothing. And I'm sure they probably give comlinks away for certain, you know, 
arrangements or deals or offers or whatever. So everybody has a comm link because that's kind of how it is. So all of these icons represent somebody's comm link or their toaster or their camera or their gun <laughs> or a, a turret or uh, an info terminal or a anything like pretty much anything that can access the matrix in any form has an icon in the matrix and so how it works is you can see it is physically oriented in the sense that when you log into the matrix virtual reality depending on where you are you're going to see icons that are nearby your physical body so if I'm standing next to Mert, uh, when I go into v VR, his icon for his comm link is going to be right next to my persona, my avatar. If somebody, if say Ziggy's standing 100 meters away from me, when I go into virtual reality, I will also see his icon for his comm link, but it's going to be a lot dimmer. And so that's kind of how it orients things. The closer things are a lot brighter, more noticeable, a lot easier to just pick up. Pick up. Uh, whereas the further away, they get more, they get dimmer, partly based on kind of uh, lag, just kind of the connection issues, uh, and partly based because it, it filters out things that are probably less important to you. Um, now, if I, I could still, I can just as easily... Um, start hacking Ziggy's comlink as Mert's comlink. Uh, I mean, more or less, we'll talk about that a little later. Like I said, it's going to be a long video. <laughs> um, but it, it, your, 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 your whole, your cyber deck or whatever you're using filters out, uh, things based on importance. In fact, your, your device automatically filters out data streams. And data streams are what they exact like they, what they sound like. They're, these are the signals that are causing all of your devices to communicate with each other and with the matrix and with the world and things like that. Um, so it automatically filters that out because otherwise that would be all you would see everywhere. Everywhere is just data streams covering everything. Um, and, but you can turn those on if you want. If, if you want to do some some hacking things. Um, so I could turn on the data stream for somebody's comm link if they're on like a secure phone connection. And with some work, you could kind of trace where that data stream is going to the other end. Um, things like, again, it's kind of a creativity thing. You can do stuff like that. Um, but it also, uh, the, the other kind of filter that it does is it doesn't show every single device. By default, it does not show every single device that is active because that would be insane, especially for each individual. Each individual might have five or six matrix enabled devices on them because uh, you got to think your your eyes, your ears, your 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 camera, your glasses, your gun, your grenades, your everything. It's all matrix and everything has its own device icon. So what it will do is it puts it all into basically one icon called a personal area network or a PAN. And so when you look at, you know, when you just look in where somebody is, you'll just see the one icon for their PAN instead of all these little points of light to kind of simplify things. Um, this is somewhat of a fluff issue, really, but I, I'm explaining it for the sake of fluff. Uh, so you see their personal area network, except for... Dangerous things. If they have a gun that's wirelessly enabled, that will be separate from the pan because they want you want to see if they have a gun, <laughs> uh, or anything that basically can kill you or do damage. So their grenades, a turret, you know, this will all be kind of separate. Okay, so that's what you see when you log into virtual reality. You see all these little points of light, all these icons for devices. You also see buildings. More or less. These are hosts. And what, like I said, hosts are basically websites. And so the good example that it gives is for uh, the Stuffer Shack. Stuffer Shack in Shadowrun is basically your most... Con it's like a 7-Eleven. Picture a 7-Eleven selling probably even more stuff. That's a Stuffer Shack. 
And so in the physical world, you can walk up to a stuffer shack, you can go in, you buy stuff, it's 7-Eleven, blah, blah, blah. But the stuffer shack also has a host, a matrix host, like a matrix website. So the stuffer shack matrix host is right on top of where it would be in the physical world. So if I'm standing outside the stuffer shack, I'm looking at it, I go into virtual reality, its host is going to be right where the physical building was, and it's probably going to look more or less exactly like it. Um, and that is not true for all hosts. In fact, that's probably not true for most of them. Stuffer Shack is kind of the, the exception. A host can look how ex- it can look however the owner wants it to. So the owner of the Stuffer Shack wants it to look just like the building. Whereas the mega corporations, they each have their own host for all their corporate shit. Uh, but their hosts basically take up the sky. <laughs> like, each of their hosts are the size of Manhattan. They're just, like, these gigantic things that take up the entire skyline of the virtual reality. So that you can never forget that the mega corporations basically lord over you. Um, they're kind of the exception because they get to do that. Um, like, if I was just a ra- random Joe, my host could not be the size of Manhattan. Um, but you could make it look like a logo or you could make it look like, uh, like a little Eiffel Tower or you could make it look like a penis. Like, I don't know, maybe it doesn't go into that, but I'm assuming, (laughs) um, so you can look however with some kind of basic rules and, uh, to, to enter a host, to enter a website, you need to have permission. Which is basically how a website works, except most websites you go to automatically give you permission. Uh, and I guess a lot of hosts also automatically give you permission. So a stuffer shack doesn't, you don't have to like be invited or anything like that. You just enter the host. Uh, but like a fancy, fancy nightclub, you might have to get permission to be able to enter the host. Or if you're, if your house, your own house has, uh, you have your own host for your house, um, you probably have permission for that. Probably the rest of your family, maybe some close friends, you all have permission to go in. And the owner, the, only the owner is allowed to give out permission. And we'll talk about permissions a little later. <laughs> um, and so inside a host is very different than the outside of a host. Uh, generally, it's bigger. Because you can make it, the, you can make the inside of a host as big as you want. You could make the inside of your house host uh, the size of Kentucky or something. Like you could just do whatever you want, and it doesn't really matter because you're not bound by any physical rules. You can make the gravity non-existent. You can make it underwater, and you can just teleport to the other side of the host. Or do whatever you want, um, depending on how the owner has laid it out. Now, in the stuffer shack example, the owner has made it probably as close to real as possible. So you can't just run around, uh, you know, you can't just fly around. It's not underwater. It's probably pretty damn close to how it is walking into a stuffer jack by design. But if you're the owner of your own host, do whatever you want. It's your playground. Um, so why would you, why would you have a host for your own house as an example? Well, like I said, every device that's connected to the matrix has its own matrix presence. It's its own device icon and all that kind of stuff. And so a good example given from the book that I'm going to, I'm going to tell you. (sighs) Okay. I get, I talked about this a little bit in the last video, but say in the real world today, right now, this might be possible. It might not be. I I actually have no idea, but I'm, I'm just, we're going to say it's possible. You're driving home from work. And you want to uh, preheat your oven to get ready for dinner. And so, somewhat dangerously, you access your phone, you pull it out while you're driving, and bring up a special app uh, for your for your for your oven at home that's that's like wirelessly enabled. Like, I don't even know if this exists, but it can't be that far off. Uh, and you set it to preheat for 350 or something like that. And then you put your phone away and you get home. And your oven's preheated 350. In Shadowrun, you what you do if you want to do something, accomplish basically the same thing, is you're driving home, and you set your car to auto drive. 
which again is not something far off from our own world. And then you go into say virtual reality as your as your line back in your chair in your car and uh, you go you instantly teleport to your host of your home and you are you're let in cuz you're the owner presumably. <laughs> and uh, you depending on how it's laid out, you go over to the device that represents your fridge. And digitally, you can check the contents of your fridge at home by just, say, opening your virtual fridge. And you could set this up however you want. You could just have it display like a list of the items. And since your your fridge is all smart and digital and all that, it catalogs every content of every item in there. And uh, you say, oh, there's a frozen pizza in there. Say, so, okay. And then you walk over to the digital icon for your oven. And you literally just reach out and turn the dial to 350. And then you log out of virtual reality and uh, you're almost home. That's kind of how it is. Now, that's just a basic example of what you can do with your own host. But basically what you do with a host is on the grid, say you're walking on the street, your devices are just out there. Like anybody that just logs into the grid can see you walking around with your devices, more or less. A host and all the devices that are connected to your host are somewhat more self-contained. So that's a very basic example with your house and the fridge that's connected to it, the oven that's connected to it, your toaster, uh, your hot tub, your TV, you know, whatever. Um, you obviously can see how that escalates then to, say, uh, corporate headquarters. The, the security turrets and terminals and, you know, um, metal detectors and all that kind of stuff. They're not just on the grid that anybody can, hey, look at this thing. They're all part of their host. They're connected to that. And so they have a digital presence then in the physical, like just like they do in the physical world. Um, because you can't just walk on the street and say, oh, there's their security turret. You can't really do that in the, the Matrix either. Okay, so... Um, okay, like I'm trying to figure out what I want to talk about. All right, so let's, I guess, then talk about hacking. That's, that's what we're here for. We want to talk about hacking. And like I said, if it makes sense, if it works for you, just, just make it happen. Just do it. It'll be cool. <laughs> Rule of cool. That's how it always is. Okay, so again, we're talking specifically about Deckers. Deckers have to have a cyber deck. You cannot hack with a comlink. It's just not possible. This is by design for the game. It just does not work because otherwise everybody would just run big comlinks and they would hack everything. Have to have a cyber deck, which is expensive, but it's worth it. And, okay, I don't want to just make this really convoluted or complicated, so I want to boil it down very simply. There are two different types of really types of hacking there's the kind of more offensive ways where you're actually trying to break something or destroy something um you want to cause something to malfunction and then there's the more utilitarian way where you want to utilize a device or you want to um edit a device's function or steal information you, know, you want to do stuff like that the more tricky shit um, those are the two different ways. So the, the aggressive one is a lot simpler. Um, and so I'll talk about that first, I guess. So you as a hacker, say you're in a firefight or your friends are in a firefight and you're sitting on the outside cause that's what you should be doing. Uh, and you're, you're logged into virtual reality, hot sim, you're running hot and you see some big ass troll is using like an assault can and he's running wild with it. And you want to just wreck that thing as quickly as possible to, to help out your friends. What you're probably going to do uh, is you're probably going to use a function called data spike. And what you're trying to accomplish is you're trying to accomplish a lot of matrix damage. Every single device, every single device has a certain amount of... Um, matrix damage boxes basically much like regular characters have physical uh boxes and stun boxes that determine how much damage they can take before they die or go unconscious every device has the same thing called uh matrix damage and so if you cause enough matrix damage 
you basically cause a device to uh, break or melt or malfunction or just basically be unusable. And so there are really two ways to accomplish that. The one way is using the brute force action, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but the more efficient way generally is to use data spike, which all it does is just sends really harmful code to the device and it causes matrix damage. And so you're going to use your cyber combat skill plus your logic and it's versus their intuition plus the firewall of the device. And uh, that's pretty much it. You just basically roll your dice. They roll their dice. And the firewall... Okay, well, I guess I, I mean, I'm kind of jumping ahead of things. So I'm actually going to take a step back. Just don't move from the data spiking. We're going to get back to that. But I need to talk about the, uh, the attributes. Every single device and host has a, a ma four different matrix attributes. These are attack, sleaze, data processing, firewall. Comlinks have data processing and firewall. Attacking and sleaze is devoted just to cyberdex because that's really for hacking. So data processing is just doing, is basically... <laughs> really pretty much like your computer's processor you know it's how much kind of data it can handle it's computational power stuff like that and your firewall is how well it is at defending against harmful shit again much like a firewall but here there's different degrees of it so you know a low a low cyber deck is running like mcafee whereas uh, a high cyber deck is running shit we don't know about yet uh okay so when you're trying to harm or work against any device you're probably going to be working against their firewall generally and general rule of thumb is their firewall or really a lot of stats are based on the uh the device's rating so a low level comlink rating one, it can be hacked with, with a fart. Like it's just it's nothing. Uh, a high level comlink a bit tougher to hack into, and so this goes for every single device. It has its own rating. Uh, so for the data spike, you're doing your skills versus the generally the intuition of the owner, uh, which is kind of strange in certain circumstances but the intuition of the owner plus the firewall of the device and uh, whatever so your your damage value is equal to the attack value of your cyber deck uh, and then you get if you get net hits it does damage and blah 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 long story short that's how you just destroy things and so what happens when you destroy things um, you probably get the general idea uh, you, you basically, you brick the item. Devices that are bricked never fail non-spectacularly. Smoke, sparks, pops, bangs, sizzles, nasty smells, and occasionally even small fires are common features of a device in the process of becoming a brick. Um, if a device is bricked, it stops working, batteries are drained, mechanical parts are fused or gummed up with melted internals, and so on. Um, now, that doesn't affect every device. Um, you can't really... Like, uh, it says a vibro sword is still sharp. Um, if you brick a lock, it still stays locked. Uh, if you want to unlock it, that's a different kind of action. Um, but guns, grenades, turrets, all sorts of things, yeah. Bricked, done. Unusable. So in a combat situation, that's probably what you're going to be doing unless you want to be a bit more creative. If you just want to be quick and helpful, brick shit, done. Uh, yeah, okay. So then, all the other stuff. This is the probably stuff that be, the things you're going to be doing more often, hopefully. Unless you're a crazy group. Uh, and that's the more kind of hacking stuff. And so you know how I said that hosts and things like that require that you have permission in order to enter? Well, permission is actually kind of a tangible thing. It's called a matrix authentication recognition key 
or a mark. And so to get into any host, um, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I want to be certain that I'm saying this correctly. To get into any host, you need a mark. So again, Stuffer Shack, just it gives out every, it just gives out marks. Uh, unless you're like banned or something, uh, you just get the mark. It's it's kind of an open, uh, much like a lot of websites are nowadays. Whereas for your home, you have uh, you actually have four marks, which means you're the owner. Only one person can ever have four marks, which means you're the owner of the place. Um, so you have four marks, um, and your, your wife might have three marks, uh, your kids might have a mark or two, or, you know, your friend might have a mark and so on and so forth. You can enter everybody else. They cannot, cause they do not have a mark, which this prevents random people walking by your house and turning on your oven to 500 degrees. <laughs> Makes sense. Now, obviously hackers can do that and it's a dangerous world we live in. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, because most people do not own Cyberdex. Uh, we haven't really talked about Cyberdex much, but they're very hard to come by, very expensive, very illegal. Not really illegal, but highly restricted. Uh, so, anyways, yeah, marks. Marks are, marks are a big deal about the whole hacking game. So, as the owner, you can give out marks to whoever, whoever you want, and you can rescind marks however you want. Um, and so, being a hacker then is not attempting to be the owner of anything, usually, because uh, that's that's really tough. Um, but to get marks, generally, illegally. Now, yeah, I mean, you could be a different kind of thing where you're a bit doing a bit more social engineering, uh, and maybe your face actually gets you a legal mark or something like that on, on a host or a device or something like that. Um, you might not always have to do it yourself to get the mark. Sometimes you, it might be given to you in some other way. But for the most part, for a lot of things, you're going to be trying to get them yourselves. There's two ways to do this. One is, again, with the brute force uh, action. The other is with the hack on the fly. Brute force is for your attack. Hack on the fly is for your sleaze. Attacking is generally more aggressive, more likely to be noticed, Sleaze is more stealthy, less likely to be noticed. So you're, if you're doing, if I'm in the middle of a firefight, and um, I like, I might, it depending on how the cyber deck, you might, I mean, you can arrange your cyber deck in different ways. Some, so some people might really just prioritize the attack value because that's what they're going to be doing. But for somebody like me who's going to be doing a lot of kind of espionage stuff, I value sleaze, which I think is how most people do it. Um, so my main action that I'm going to be doing a lot throughout this campaign is called hack on the fly. And this uses my hacking skill plus my logic limited by the sleaze of my cyber deck. And this is versus the intuition plus the firewall of the device or host. Now hosts have their own rating. It starts at one for the lowliest I don't remember what it, I, a low, a, a one rating is for like a public education building. <laughs> like it's for like, uh, like a public school as a one rating because who the hell's hacking a public school? Um, your, your, your own home, depending on where you live, your own home might have a one or a two rating. Uh, but it goes all the way up to 12. 12 is for, of course, the, the Megacorp headquarters and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but in between, you have stuff like small colleges, the local police station, uh, low-level government buildings, um, regional corporate hosts, things like that. And so all of a host's stats are based on its rating. So probably pretty easy to break into somebody's home's host. But again, mega corporation. You have to be the god of all hackers, and even then, probably not. So, okay, so you're going up against their stats, and again, this is for the device or the host. Devo devices all have their own firewall stats. 
And using this action, if you succeed, you get more net hits than they do. You get one mark on the device or host. Um, and so if you get a, a mark on a host, you can enter it. You still might not be allowed to wander around the host. Like, <laughs> There's security, digital security, that will still probably notice you, even if you have a mark. Uh, that doesn't guarantee you're just, oh, I can wander around, no problem. Um, if you have three marks, it might be even suspicious. Like, Who's this guy I've never seen before with three marks? Um, and if you have marks on devices, you can then interact with them. You can do all sorts of things. I'm not going to go into it. Um, and I'm really, I'm leaving quite a bit out of the whole Matrix stuff, but I'm trying to just boil it down. Um... But the most basic things you can do are you can edit a file. And if this means more, it means like in a literal sense, you can go to like a document and edit it if you have one mark on it. But this also means in a more creative sense, say you have a camera, you have camera footage, uh, and I wanted to loop the footage like they do in the movies so that it just shows the empty hallway instead of my friends creeping through, you would use the edit file action. Which is, I know it's weird to say, but that's what you would use. Um, um, you could also do, you could crack a file to remove the protection on it. Um, you could... Send a message through somebody's device if you had a mark on it. Uh, yeah. And then you can also uh, do perform. Why is that not in the book? <laughs> okay. I don't know why it's not showing up. But if you wanted to perform a free action from a device, you could use, you only need one mark. So a free action is obviously not a, a huge deal. Like free action is like, like if you hack into a camera, you get one mark on a camera, you can use a free action to look through the camera. Like it's really not much for doing most actions. One mark is not a whole lot. And so you're probably going to want more than one mark. Uh, and so if you get two marks, you can then perform simple actions. And this is where things get more interesting. If you perform simple actions, uh, if you perform a simple action with like a turret, you can, you, you can do the simple action to fire like a single round, or you can cause somebody's to somebody's clip to eject, or you can activate a grenade or something like that. Uh, so simple actions is where things get really interesting. If you have three marks, which is the most you can really have. Uh, you can do complex actions. So, um, this is where if I wanted a, a turret to fire like a burst of, of shots, that would be, that would be a complex action. Or if I wanted to reboot the device, uh, that would be three. Or I think format the device even. Yeah, I could format a device with three, which rewrites the whole boot code and all that. Um... Which is basically the sneaky way to cause something to kind of brick. More or less. Um, so yeah, most of the hacking then revolves around getting marks and then utilizing those marks to do what you want. That's what it boils down to. That's really kind of the simple thing. And really, you don't need it that much more complicated than that. I mean, I guess if you want to do... If you want to get really involved... Um, you kind of go into the kind of security things and you go into battling other deckers in the matrix. So there's matrix initiatives and matrix defense actions. And you're trying to, um, you're trying to cause like biofeedback to them and stuff like that. I don't really want to get into that. Uh, if it comes to that, um, you just kind of do the simple like, Shadowrun is complicated, but it generally boils down to simple, mostly simple roles of just a skill plus a an attribute. Um, the Matrix generally uses either device ratings, host ratings, or uh, your, your cyberdeck attributes and things like that. 
okay. So then finally, I guess, uh, I know I probably could go for another hour easily, easily. But the final thing I, I just wanted to mention here is in the quick start rules, which if you're curious about all this, the quick start rules are free and talk about the matrix a little bit. Um, but for the, uh, the food fight in, in a stuffer shack. So in the quick start rules, they have a quick little thing that happens. A fight happens in a stuffer shack and it includes a Decker pre-made character. And so there's a section here during the little thing that says, if the hacker can't decide what to do, feel free to drop hints. Here are some ideas, which can also be used for blah, blah, blah. Each requires the hacker to get at least one mark sometimes more on the device by making either a hack on the fly action and rolling hacking plus logic versus intuition plus firewall or a brute force action and rolling cyber combat plus logic versus willpower plus firewall. Again, most most hacking comes down to those two actions for getting marks and then doing shit. And so here are the uh, examples of things that the hacker could do in this one little thing. Take control of the floor waxing drone, crashing it into people or blocking their path. Turn off the store lights. Activate the sprinkler system. Hijack a nearby car and drive it remotely. Unlock various shelves in the store, such as the first aid supplies or the SIM chips cabinet. Remotely activate the panic but button alarm system. Unlock the rear doors in area F. Or set any of the machines in area D to dispense schmoozies, soy calf, and more. This can be used to blind nearby characters or coat the floor so people slip. And that's just kind of eight simple examples of the things that a hacker could do during a firefight. Um, and that's, so that's really what it comes down to is why I love the matrix and the hacking and all that so much is it's really only limited by your creativity. Um, and so I, I'm kind of hoping, at least for this campaign, somewhat of a middle ground for the complexity that, uh, Ziggy and I arrive at for the hacking. I, I don't know if I would really love full, fully involved the matrix and all that because it gets really involved with ice and agents and um, black ice and um, overwatch and all these different actions and tracing and like the overwatch if you're doing shit on the grid you you get like the the gm is supposed to roll every round or so secretly uh for your overwatch score and you can check it occasionally if you want but if it reaches a certain point then god is on to you and you have to kind of like it's just there's so much to it uh it's really convoluted whereas on the other side if you just go really simple it's just kind of like okay roll your hacking um oh you gotta you gotta hit all right you hack the thing and you get the stuff uh, and it's just, it's way boiled down to the point of when you really need a hacker at all. So a middle ground is where I'm looking at. Um, but yeah, I, ho I hopefully, uh, I gave you some perspective on how the matrix and hackings work. If not, hopefully I entertained you while I talked for an hour again. Uh, but it's something that I'm very, uh, interested and excited about. Um, and it should be a lot of fun just coming up with, uh, things to hack, ways to hack them, things to do. Um, yeah, again, limited by your creativity, which is why it's so cool. But all right. So my name is Mang. This has been a, uh, a primer somewhat on the matrix and hacking it for Shadowrun fifth edition. And, uh, I'll see you fine folks for the first session. <laughs>